very wonderful to have have such an enthusiastic international audience from around the world. Um, thank you for joining from so many different time zones today. Um, I've just lost the script, there we go. So my name is Alex Dutton. I'm the head of education at Phoenix Space and I'm very excited and privileged to welcome all of you to the Phoenix Space advanced lecture series delivered by some of the world's leading academics. So Phoenix Space is an innovative nonprofit organization focused on educating, empowering and inspiring refugees and disadvantaged youth in the Middle East through space science and technological education. Today's lecture, as you already know, will be on the subject of gravitational waves and their theory and methods of detection. Gravitational waves are a phenomenon first theorized and debated over a century ago by some of the most august names in physics at the time, but only recently have we begun to collect strong data and confirmation of their existence. The importance of this observation is reflected in the awarding of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics to Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne. I do want to point out uh, an advanced understanding of physics and math will be helpful to following this lecture. We're privileged to have Dr. Dayan Mihailov, a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Potsdam, part of the Albert Einstein Institute for Gravitational Physics. His main research focus revolves around methods for detection and classification of gravitational waves. Dr. Mihailov completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Oxford and obtained his PhD at the University of Cambridge. I'm very honored to welcome back Dr. Uh, Dr. Mihailov for his second lecture with Phoenix Space after also debuting our first online lecture on the history, of, uh, history and physics of black holes to our students back in November. So just before we get started, there's uh, a, few house uh, a few house rules I would like to go over. The lecture will last approximately one hour. Dr. Mihailov will pause periodically during the lecture for a question and answer. Please submit your questions anytime through the Q&A option below. We will also have another 30 minutes at the end for any additional questions. This lecture will be recorded and posted on our website and shared through our social media channels. If you would like to subscribe to our newsletter for future, future offerings, please do sign up via, sorry, via our website. And lastly, please don't forget to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar for any additional topic, topics you would like to see in the future of this series. So on that note, the virtual floors is yours, Dr. Mihailov. Thank you very much, Mr. Dutton, for the nice introduction. Uh, and welcome everybody to our lecture tonight. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Dayan. I work on gravitational wave science. Uh, I'm right now here at the Institute for uh, Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, just outside of Berlin. And tonight we are going to be talking about gravitational waves. Before I launch into a full-scale explanation with maths and notes, it will probably be helpful uh, if I tell you a little bit about uh, how gravitational waves came to be and why they suddenly became such an important topic uh, in physics and in astronomy in the past five years, actually. So it's a very interesting story. So uh, all the way back in the uh, early 1900s, uh, a guy called Albert Einstein, very smart person, uh, was thinking about the universe. And uh, as he was thinking about the universe, uh, he postulated uh, his theory of general relativity. And I have indeed previously talked about the theory of general relativity to Phoenix Space uh, and to many other, uh, many other forms. Uh, so if you want to hear a popular lecture, lecture about gravitational waves, you are more than welcome to search uh, YouTube uh, for any talks by me. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can find more than five of them uh, in different length and detail. But all of them are very popular level talks where I try to explain gravitational waves uh, in a common language and make them accessible to non-scientists. What we want to do tonight uh, is take a more uh, pedagogic look at gravitational waves uh, and look at the 
knowledge that one has to accumulate in order to then understand how gravitational waves emerge as part of the general theory of relativity, which is one of Einstein's greatest achievements. So in, in around the 1960, uh, Einstein had already written down his theory of relativity uh, and was figuring out the details of that. Um, and as he was figuring out these uh, edge details uh, that fit his to fit his theory, uh, he postulated the existence of so-called gravitational waves. So to understand them better, uh, it's important to realize what Einstein's theory of relativity uh, really says. And the theory of general relativity uh, can be summarized in an equation very beautifully. General relativity can be summarized in the so-called Einstein equation, which is that G mu nu is equal to eight pi t mu nu. Now, this equation, as I've written it down, might seem very obscure, uh, but I'll explain what it means in layman's terms now, and later on in the lecture, we will actually use it to derive the equation which governs gravitational waves. So as every equation, it has two sides, the left side here and right side here. And what Einstein's theory of general relativity says at the most basic level uh, is that the motion and distribution of matter and energy in the universe is governed by this equation. The left-hand side, g mu nu, is a measure of the geometry of space. So it, it's a measure of where in the cosmos, where in space, uh, stars and black holes and planets are located. On the other side is the matter term, so 8 pi t mu nu, which tells you how the matter is and energy is distributed in the universe. So what Einstein's equation, the foundation of general relativity says, uh, is that the distribution of matter governs the motion of bodies in the universe and vice versa. The motion of bodies then affects the geometry of space-time. And you know, this is, this is not an equation that you can derive through conventional terms. It's uh, a so-called empiric equation uh, that took Einstein many trials and errors to figure out. So he had to, he had to uh, look for many different ways to encode the information about the geometry of space-time in this so-called Einstein tensor G mu nu, so that it is equal on the right-hand side to the distribution of matter T mu nu up to some factor. And this is, this is why the this is why this equation is so beautiful and significant uh, is because it's, it cannot be somehow derived through in, in, in the normal way that we are used to seeing formulas emerge in mathematics. Uh, it is an equation which has, which Einstein thought of on his own and offered as an explanation of how gravity works in the universe. This is one of his biggest contributions the theory of general relativity. And it's something that since then has been verified again and again by science. Now, how do gravitational waves emerge from this equation? You can remember that a few minutes ago, I told you that on one hand, the distribution and the position of bodies in the universe affects the motion of matter and energy and vice versa. Now, the motion of black holes and stars uh, and planets uh, has a ripple effect in space-time. As these bodies move in space-time, you can imagine that the effect is much akin to 
a boat moving in circles in water. So if we have if we have two black holes which somewhere in space are orbiting each other, we have two black holes that somewhere in space they are orbiting around their common center. Now, what happens is that as these two black holes move through space-time, they create a so-called ripple effect. And in this process, they generate gravitational waves, which are emitted away from them in a concentric manner. As the two black holes orbit each other and gradually plunge towards each other, so they get closer, the energy which is liberated from this process is then emitted in the form of gravitational waves. Now, the person who first, who first suggested this explanation was Einstein uh, in, again, 1916. He was himself very doubtful whether gravitational waves really exist. And back then, he didn't have the means or the equipment to make the detection possible. So he could only theorize. He was a theoretical physicist. Now, many years later, after the Second World War had passed as well, uh, and people had more time to uh, devote to theoretical science rather than practical engineering, people started thinking again about these gravitational waves and whether they could be detected. Uh, for many years, uh, no one could come up with a direct way of verifying that gravitational waves exist. Very interestingly, in 1974, two scientists, two British scientists, managed to detect two very small neutron stars, which are orbiting each other. So two neutron stars. A neutron star is a star like our sun. Uh, however, it's entirely made out of neutron plasma, uh, which means that it is considerably smaller than a star like the sun. So uh, a neutron star could typically uh, be only 10 or 20 kilometers in diameter, but still have mass bigger than the mass of the sun. It's a very condensed star, which is made out of neutron plasma. Now, they detected two of these neutron stars orbiting each other. Uh, and they managed, because of the pulses that these stars emitted, uh, they managed to detect that the two stars are gradually getting closer and closer to each other on each consecutive orbit. So each consecutive orbit brings them closer together. Over the course of months, years, the two stars are gradually getting closer. This was the first indirect verification that gravitational waves exist because they could see that energy is lost in this process. So it has to go somewhere when energy is, is emitted. However, they couldn't detect the gravitational waves actually being generated and propagating from this event. They, so they were awarded the Nobel Prize for indirectly verifying gravitational waves, among other things, with this very important discovery of depth. Now, this was in 1974, I believe. Uh, it wasn't until the 1990s when a very important experiment was built in the United States. Two detectors, and here I'm getting ahead of my plan for the lecture. Uh, this is certainly material for the last lecture of the series, but it's important that I mention it now, uh, that two very big detectors were built with the sole purpose of detecting gravitational waves once and for all. Uh, the two detectors 
in the US, one in the state of Louisiana and one in the state of Washington are huge. They have, um, they are L-shaped and they have a size of each arm of around four kilometers. In each of these directions, there is a four kilometer tunnel. And there's two of these effectors in the US. They were built in the 90s. Nowadays, there are a few more, one built in Italy, uh, a little bit smaller, another one in Japan, uh, and another one is currently being built in India as well. But the two detectors built in the US uh, were the pioneers that uh, were launched with the purpose of detecting gravitational waves. Uh, initially, they weren't successful, uh, and it was expected that uh, many cycles of hardware improvement would be necessary before they can make a successful detection of gravitational waves. However, in 2015, uh, after they were launched for the, I think, four or fifth time after being upgraded, they managed to detect the first real event of a gravitational wave, which was propagating from the collision of two black holes somewhere far away in the universe and was detected on the Earth. So very interestingly, yeah, Einstein postulated gravitational waves for the first time in 1916. And only in 2015, we managed to make a positive detection of gravitational waves, thus confirming Einstein's uh, theory in yet another way. He is right a lot. Now, uh, even though it was detected, the, this event was detected in 2015, it took a few more months to verify that this is indeed what we think it is. So a team of several thousand scientists took several months to pour over the data, analyze it in many different ways and verify that this is not some glitch that has affected these two detectors, but instead is a real gravitational wave event. And after this was done, the first detection was formally announced on the 11th of February, 2016, already a hundred years after the paper by Einstein, which first proposed the existence of gravitational waves. Uh, very interestingly, the formal announcement was made on the 11th of February, 2016, uh, which means that the fifth anniversary of this announcement was only six days ago, last Thursday. Since then, we have actually managed to detect tens and very close to a hundred other events of two black holes merging and emitting a gravitational wave signal. Uh, we have learned how to how to differentiate between two black holes merging and emitting a gravitational wave versus two neutron stars merging and emitting a gravitational wave. Uh, we have learned to classify and from the gravitational wave signal, learn more about the parameters of each of the objects that was, that was participating in this so-called event. We have learned to uh, measure the masses of each of the two black holes to measure their spins. The spin is the speed with which, with which an object rotates around its own axis. So we've learned to measure their spins, their masses, and other important properties if they are, for example, um, neutron stars instead of black holes. Very interestingly, this has immensely improved our understanding of black holes. We talk a lot about black holes because they're some of the most elusive objects in the universe, but it's a very little known fact that prior to detecting gravitational waves, 
we had detected with certainty no more than a few tens of black holes in the entire universe. Now, each time that we detect a gravitational wave, we have the chance to study three new black holes. The two black holes that participate in the merger, in the coalescence of the two objects, and then the new black hole, which is the result of the two black holes merging and forming a new black hole in the end. So each time that we detect such an event, we learn more information about three new black holes. This has, of course, increased our understanding of black holes and has allowed us to start testing some of the predictions that people like Stephen Hawking have made about them over the years. He is also a theoretical physicist and he has also made a number of predictions about black holes and how they behave, especially when they undergo a merger like this. One of his most important theorems that he has uh, written down is what happens to the surface area of the black holes when they merge and form a new black hole. As we detect more and more gravitational waves, we can start testing these predictions and find out if what Stephen Hawking has predicted is also correct. We have many other interesting scientific projects in mind that we would be able to do in the coming months and years with the data coming from the two detectors in the USA, the so-called LIGO detectors. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Laser interferometer, because this is the scientific principle on which these, these um, detectors operate. Together with the detector in Italy called Virgo and the newly launched detector Kagura in Japan, they are all working as a network to search the sky and detect gravitational waves. My job. Uh, at the moment is focused primarily on developing new models through which we can better detect and analyze gravitational waves. The way in which we find a gravitational wave in the data that is recorded by these detectors is that we have what is called a model for a gravitational wave. So we have the knowledge of what a gravitational wave looks like for a given for, for given two black holes of a certain mass and a certain spin, which again is how fast an object rotates around its own, its own axis. So for, for each of these parameters, we have a formula which tells us what the gravitational wave would look like. When we detect some signal which we suspect could be a gravitational wave event, which we study this signal by trying to find the correct parameters, the correct masses of the two objects, and the correct spins which would produce this kind of gravitational wave that we suspect that we have detected. This is a very big area of study, and it's very important that we are able to produce accurate models of gravitational waves, because we want to better learn what these parameters are. But also it's very important that they are so-called computationally cheap. It means that when we, when a computer is tasked with calculating this formula and producing the shape of the gravitational wave, it is possible for, for this to happen very quickly. Because in order to complete one analysis of one event, uh, a computer program the software which does that needs to generate several million of these models. So having efficient 
computationally cheap, as I called them earlier, models is very important. And a big part of my work is focused on developing such models that can then be used to study gravitational waves. Now, the reason I give you this introduction is to entice you and show you that there are very interesting problems that can be studied in the area of gravitational wave astronomy. Unfortunately, in order to be able to do that, one has to first uh, learn a large amount of theory, a large amount of formulas to understand how this actually happens, to understand how, for example, gravitational waves emerge from the theory of general relativity and how to write down the formulae which we then use in order to create these models of gravitational waves. So with this, shall I call them experimental lectures, uh, our goal is to invite you to learn more about gravitational waves. This would be useful for you if you have an interest in this and if at some point you plan to study gravitational waves uh, at a higher level, for example, uh, at a university or even uh, at a, at, as your doctoral thesis. There are many popular lectures, again, that you can find, uh, but there are also a large number of books that you can read, which will uh, present the material which I plan to uh, lecture you on in different ways. Hopefully, uh, I'll manage to present it in an understandable way. We'll start soon. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to ask if there are any questions which I can address now before going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. There's, um, there's three questions here um, at the moment that are being submitted. Um, I think, can you, can you see them? Can you see the open questions in the Q&A or would you like me to read them out? I cannot see them, uh, so okay. I'd be very grateful if you could read them out for me. Fantastic. Okay, so um, the first one by uh, which is which is from uh, Patrick Longer. Uh, oh, there's four now. Um, so the first question is how did how did the scientists deduce that the loss of energy in these rotations uh, was due to uh, gravitational waves carrying away this energy and not by let's say like classical means like uh, radiation? Well, gravitational wave is actually a radiation. Uh, however, in space, uh, the vast majority of space is actually vacuum. So radiation cannot really, uh, radiation cannot account for all the energy that is carried away in this process. Einstein was looking exactly at this problem, trying to figure out where does the energy from this, when, when two objects are brought closer together, where does the energy go? And, you know, he calculated that the only possible explanation is that, there, that the energy is carried away in the form of gravitational waves. Very, very curiously, he himself was not certain of, of this prediction, and he actually went back and forth on it several times in his career. Um, several times he, he actually, after publishing the paper postulating gravitational waves, he then actually uh, a second time retracted it and said that gravitational waves don't exist. Later on in his career, he made some more calculations and again went back to the opinion that gravitational waves do exist and this is how energy is carried in the universe. So the, the most concise way to, to describe gravitational waves, this is these are ripples through space-time which carry energy in the universe. Right. So, that makes sense? so yeah, just uh just to quickly follow follow that question up. Um is is the order of magnitude of the energy loss due to this form of gravitational radiation, is it significantly higher than you'd expect via electromagnetic radiation? Yes. In, okay. in, the, in a process like the one that I've drawn uh, here, first of all, black holes don't really have uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, by all means, Newton stars do. 
for black holes are black because they don't emit anything apart from Hawking radiation, but that's a very, very, amount, very small amount of radiation. The amount of, of energy that is uh, emitted in the form of gravitational waves in the process of two black holes merging and forming a new black hole could be on the order of several, several solar masses. So in, mm. in, in astrophysics, for, for uh, convenience, we often measure things, measure large masses in units of the mass of the sun. So when I say several solar masses, it means that the mass which has been released as energy is several times the mass of the sun, for example, two or three times. And how this mass is converted to energy is again explained by Einstein with the very famous formula E is equal to mc squared. So m here is the mass of the, the mass that is emitted as energy. So say two times the mass of the sun. This is the symbol for the mass of the sun. Mm. So two times the mass of the sun, according to this formula, E is equal to mc squared, is released as energy in such a process. Okay, thank you very much. So um, just in the in the interest of, of keeping the, the lecture flowing, I'm just going to, to submit one more one more question for you, although I have several of my own. Um, and I, I can already hazard uh, an answer to this, but this is from uh, Abhish, Abhishek it, Itkika. Um, and it was, uh, and the question is, why is the arm length chosen to be four kilometers? I imagine it's some sort of, I mean, if it was very short, you wouldn't be able to detect them. And if it was very long, it would be very expensive. Is there anything more to it than that? Yes, this is, this is more or less the answer. The effect of gravitational waves so far away from their origin is absolutely minuscule. Uh, and it was a trade-off between us being able to detect them and of course, keeping the detectors and the budget for them to some uh, manageable level. Uh, when these detectors were built, uh, the project, uh, the, the initial stage of the project cost a billion dollars because one billion dollars to, to build these two detectors and it has cost a lot more money to maintain and upgrade them uh, since then. Gravitation waves are a very, very minuscule effect. Uh, so I will come back to the question of how does how do gravitational waves affect uh, something which has the size of four kilometers as they pass through it? Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I will reserve the other questions and I will type up your answers now. Um, let's uh, let's go on. Thank you. Of course. So uh, now that I have given you some introduction to the topic. Uh, it's perhaps time to write down some equations. And what we are going to be doing today, uh, I'm not sure if we will manage to finish on time. Let's, let's see, um, is to start from this equation that I have written down. I'll write it again here. is to start from this equation called the Einstein equation, which I would mark with number one, and get to a wave equation. So an equation of the form x uh, is equal to f. So some second derivative of a variable is equal to some other function, which is the wave equation in physics. So what, what I want to show you is how for gravitational waves, the Einstein equation reduces to a wave equation, which means that we, we can solve it and it means that gravitational, this gravitational radiation propagates as waves. Okay, in some time I will stop again and, and ask for some questions from you. Uh, but for now, uh, we can imagine space very far away from, for example, these two black holes. Very far away from them, uh, we can imagine that space is flat because there are no 
uh, there are not any significant massive bodies which would perturb it. So a flat space is represented by the so-called Minkowski metric. The Minkowski metric is represented as a matrix as eta mu nu is equal to, and now this is a diagonal matrix, minus one, 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 with everywhere else zero. Far away from any massive bodies, this is what space looks like. It's a flat space. The minus one is the, is, signifies the time direction in space time, and the three ones uh, signify the three space direction, the three spatial components of space time. Now, on top of this Minkowski flat metric, let's consider a very small perturbation, a small deviation from the Minkowski metric, which we can write down as a metric G mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus some perturbation H mu nu, okay? So the physical metric, which governs how things are distributed in space is G mu nu, this physical metric. The perturbation to Minkowski, to the Minkowski flat space time uh, is this H mu nu, which for now we're going to assume that H mu nu uh, is a tensor field in the Minkowski background. So it, it behaves like a tensor and it transfers as a tensor. For those of us who are listening, uh, but are not uh, mathematicians or physicists, uh, a tensor uh, is a fancy word for a multidimensional matrix. So for example, uh, a matrix like that is also a tensor. Now, we're also going to assume that since this is a perturbation, so it's a very small quantity compared to one, so compared to the ones here, H is a very small quantity. We're going to, uh, to write this down formally and you know, say that the H mu nu is much smaller than one. And we're going to, to use the big O notation to say that this is on the order of epsilon, where epsilon is a small number. Because we then, uh, later on, we're going to relate some other quantities to this epsilon and compare them to H mu nu. Now, the physical metric G mu nu is given by this. The inverse of the metric, so G upper indices mu nu, is given by the following, eta mu nu minus H mu nu. And we can verify this by observing that G mu nu as the physical metric uh, has to obey the identity relation. So that if we multiply G mu nu times its inverse G mu rho, we have to get one, which in this case is represented by delta rho mu. So this is something that we impose, okay? Now we can multiply equation two by equation three and check whether this uh, relation is observed. If we multiply for the first few equations, I'm going to write them out, but for others, I will invite you to verify them uh, if you do, if you would like after the lecture, because we would not have time to go through all the calculations, no matter how much I enjoy writing out maths. So if we multiply G mu nu and G mu rho, G mu nu is eta mu nu plus H mu nu. And we want to multiply this by 
theta nu rho minus h nu rho. Okay, so this is a multiplication of two binomials. We open the brackets and we multiply each term eta mu nu times eta nu rho plus eta mu nu. So this is now minus actually. Eta minus eta mu nu times h nu rho plus h mu nu times eta nu rho, and then minus h mu nu times h nu rho. Okay, now let's look at this. This is eta mu nu times eta nu rho for the Minkowski flat space time, we know that this relation is observed. So we know that this is equal to delta rho mu already. We have to deal with the other three terms. Now, this term, we have to observe that this is equal to h being multiplied by itself. And we already agreed that h is a quantity much smaller than one. We already here have a quantity which is on the order of, which is one, so on the order of one. We have two quantities which are order of epsilon multiplied by order of one, and again, order of, of epsilon multiplied by order of one. So these two quantities would be order of epsilon, but this quantity is epsilon squared, which means it is much smaller than the other three quantities preceding it. Therefore, we will disregard this quantity because it is order of epsilon squared. And so far we have written our theory only up to order epsilon. So we cannot expect that order epsilon squared terms will obey our equations. We can of course add a second order term here and then see what happens at second order but so far we are working only up to first order. Okay. So here, eta mu nu acting on H nu rho has the effect of bringing the new end, the index nu down. So this becomes H mu rho. And then for this term, the new index is brought down by the, sorry, the new index is brought up by the action of eta nu rho for an h mu rho plus order of epsilon squared coming from the last term. Now, the second and the third term cancel. And we are left with delta rho mu plus order of epsilon squared. So we verified that equation three is indeed the inverse of the metric given in equation two up to second order as we expected it to be. Okay. Now that we have figured this out, this is the building block of everything else that goes into the left-hand side of the Einstein equation, g mu nu. So our next task is to compute g mu nu. Now, for those of you not in the know, g mu nu, called the Einstein tensor, g mu nu is equal to r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu. <clears throat> the same g mu nu that we have been dealing with so far. r mu nu is called the Ricci tensor and r is called the Ricci scalar. r mu nu can be written as 
g new row multiplying r mu pardon me let me correct this so here we have to use two more indices g rho sigma multiplying the Riemann tensor r uh, again let me correct this r rho mu sigma nu this is called the Riemann tensor and it is built from the Christoffel symbols. So the precise formula is d rho gamma mu nu sigma minus d sigma gamma mu nu rho plus gamma mu rho lambda gamma lambda mu sigma minus gamma mu sigma lambda gamma lambda nu rho. This is the Riemann tensor. And finally, these capital gamma symbols are called Christoffel symbols or also the metric connection. So they are a direct measure, direct function of the metric g mu nu. So each of, each of these gammas can be written as gamma mu nu rho is equal to a half g, g is the metric tensor, g mu sigma, and then in brackets, d for derivative, again, d nu g sigma rho plus d rho g nu sigma minus d sigma g nu rho. So here we have the Christoffel symbols as a function of g. And we know that g mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus h mu nu. And the inverse of the metric g mu nu is equal to eta mu nu minus h mu nu upstairs. So as our first task, we will substitute these two expressions into this one and see what the Christoffel symbols are equal to as a function of h, which is the metric perturbation, okay? So if we do that, let's write it out at least this time. So one half of here, we substitute the expression for G upstairs mu sigma. So that is eta mu sigma minus H mu sigma. Now here we have D a derivative acting on G. G is made up of eta plus H. However, if we go back to here, we see that eta is a constant. So when a derivative acts on a constant, the result is zero. Go back here, the derivative d nu acting on G sigma rho means that, so let's write d nu g sigma rho would be equal to d nu eta sigma rho plus h sigma rho. Eta nu rho, the, met, the Minkowski flat metric is a constant, so a derivative acting on it, the result would be zero. So we are left only with the derivative nu acting on h sigma rho. And similarly for the other two terms, in the brackets here. So the result would be d nu h sigma rho plus d rho h nu sigma from this term 
minus d sigma h mu rho from the last term. Now, we take a look at the whole equation again. We have eta, which is on the order of one, also written as epsilon to the zero, because anything to the zero power is one. And we have h, which is on the order of epsilon in these brackets. Here, we have three terms, each of which involves h, so each of them will be of order epsilon. So the whole bracket is order epsilon. Now, this means that when we open the brackets, eta will be order one multiplying order epsilon, will give us order of order epsilon, but h upstairs mu sigma multiplying the second bracket will give us quantities which are order epsilon two, epsilon squared. So they would be too high, too high order for our purposes, so we'll discard them. We are only interested in keeping linear terms because we want to see the linearized Einstein equation as a function of the metric perturbation, h mu nu. This means that we discard all terms which result from multiplying h mu sigma by these three terms in the bracket. And we are left with an expression for the Christoffel symbols as one half eta upstairs mu sigma d nu h sigma rho plus d rho h nu sigma, nu sigma minus d sigma h nu rho. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to do is now that we have the Christoffel symbols, gamma mu nu rho as a function of h, the metric perturbation, to go back to the next thing that we want to calculate, namely the Riemann tensor. So we have four separate terms. The first two involve derivatives of these Christoffel symbols, the metric connections. And the second, the third and the fourth term involve multiplying two copies of these metric connections by each other. We can already see that since we have order one here and we have order of epsilon here, the whole expression for the metric connection is of order epsilon to the first power. So here, when we multiply two copies of these expressions, we would get automatically order of epsilon squared and order of epsilon squared, which for now, we don't care about. So we only need to concern ourselves with the first two terms of the Riemann tensor in order to calculate it as a function of the metric perturbation to linear order. So we can write this down as one half, and then in brackets, we have d nu d rho h mu sigma plus d mu d sigma h nu rho minus d mu d rho h nu sigma minus d nu d sigma h mu rho. This is the result of plugging this expression into this formula for the Riemann tensor. Now that we have an expression for the Riemann tensor, let's call it five, we go on. The next thing that we want to calculate is the rich tensor, which is given by this formula. It involves a simple contraction with the inverse of the metric g rho sigma times the Riemann tensor. So to calculate r mu nu involves multiplying again the inverse 
metric is equal to the flat background space time e to mu nu minus h mu nu. h mu nu is a gain of order epsilon. So when we multiply it by something where each term is just involves one h, so it is already order epsilon, we don't need to concern ourselves with the h upstairs rho sigma in this equation, only with the eta rho sigma in this equation. And that allows us to write down the Ricci tensor as one half the rho d mu h nu rho plus one half the rho d nu h nu rho minus one half the rho the rho h mu nu minus one half d mu d nu h rho rho h rho rho here so when when the metric uh, when the perturbation metric tensor is contracted so it's multiplied by h mu nu it results in having the same indices upstairs and downstairs. So it's H mu mu. Since these are Einstein indices, it can be equivalently written as H rho rho or H any other Greek letter twice, upstairs and downstairs. This is then equal to the trace of this matrix and this matrix. And the trace is just denoted as H, simple H with no indices. So here I can in fact delete the two rows and leave it as a simple H, which signifies the trace of the tensor. And again, here we can add a plus order epsilon squared, which includes terms that we don't care about at this point. We are very close at this, uh, to, to being able to write down the left-hand side of the Einstein equation. We have R mu nu, which is the Ricci tensor, which is one of the quantities here. We need, we only need R, which is called the Ricci scalar. And it is obtained by again contracting the Ricci tensor with the metric tensor. G mu nu times R mu nu. Again, each of these terms here involves one factor of h, which is a four order epsilon. So we need to only multiply this by eta mu nu times r mu nu, which gives us for the rigid scalar something that you can calculate on your own. It involves basically very easily contracting the remaining indices here. So you can write it down as one half, looking at this equation, equation six, involves contracting the remaining indices, d rho, d mu h mu rho plus one half d rho d mu h mu rho minus one half d rho d rho. Now, h is being contracted by eta mu nu. So this will be just the trace of h, mu nu h. And finally, we have another copy of the same thing, minus one half d mu d mu h. Now we have all the ingredients to cook up the Einstein tensor G mu nu given here. It involves taking the expression for R mu nu, equation six, and then subtracting from this one half times R given by equation seven here times the metric tensor 
g mu nu. You can do this very easily. I can tell you that the result for g mu nu is equal to the following. One half d rho d mu h nu rho plus one half d rho d nu h mu mu rho minus one half d rho d rho h mu nu minus one half d mu d mu h and finally minus one half eta mu nu and in brackets d rho d sigma h rho sigma minus d rho d rho h so this is the expression for the left hand side of the einstein equation now we have to equate this to this is now equal to eight pi t mu nu. And this allows us already to start making some conclusions about the matter, the distribution of matter in t mu nu. Because in the left-hand side, in the Einstein tensor g mu nu, every term involves one copy of h. This means that the whole left hand side is of order epsilon because it involves one order of h, one power of h. This means in order for it to be equal to t mu nu, that t mu nu, the so-called energy uh, momentum tensor, also needs to be small. So this also needs to be of order epsilon for this equation to work. Now, I told you that by doing this, we will derive the wave equation. This doesn't yet look like a wave equation. However, we can employ a mathematical trick of calling something by a shorthand. And what I want to do is call the call h mu nu bar the reduced metric perturbation and set this equal to h mu nu minus one half h. H is again the trace of this tensor times eta mu nu. H here again is the contraction of eta with h mu nu. We can invert this relation to, so they, this basically gives us h bar as a function of h. We would like to invert this equation and get h as a function of h bar. So in order to do this, um, what do we do? We can get this equation and put this term on the left-hand side. However, we're still left with an h on the left-hand side then. So we would like to find the relation between h and h bar. So the scalar h bar is equal is found by contracting eta mu nu bar with h bar mu nu. So this is equal to eta mu nu times h mu nu, just applying here, putting the definition of h mu nu given in this equation, minus one half h eta mu, mu nu eta mu nu lower. This gives us H and this multiplying the two 
the inverse flat metric with the flat metric uh, gives us four. So this is equal to h minus one half times four times h also equal to minus h. So the relation between h bar and h is given by this. So now we can go back here and we can write down h mu nu is equal to h bar mu nu, the reduced metric perturbation, minus one half, because it's a plus when we send this term on the other side, and a minus from this, minus one half h bar eta mu nu. Now, we have an expression for h in terms of the reduced metric perturbation h bar, which is what we wanted here. We go back to the Einstein equation in the form that we have written it down here. And we substitute everywhere that we see h with two indices or contracted, we substitute either this expression or this expression. And if we do all this, we get the following equation. Okay, We get d rho, d rho h bar mu nu is equal to 16 pi, because there is going to be a one half on the left hand side that I'm going to put on the on the right hand side 16 pi t mu nu. There are several other assumptions that go into this final step, but it basically allows us to write down an equation which is very interestingly exactly in the form of the wave equation that I promised to derive in the beginning. This box that uh, I've written down, uh, the D'Alembertian is equal to two, 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 two derivatives multiplied by each other, d mu, d mu. So this can be written down as h bar mu nu, the second derivative of h bar mu nu is equal to 16 pi t mu nu. So what this means is that each of the components of the metric tensor perturbation satisfies a wave equation with the right hand side given by the components of the energy momentum tensor t mu nu. What we have shown just now is that a small perturbation in flat space time can obey and obeys the wave equation which is what we can now solve this equation. We can now solve and find out more properties of gravitational waves. This is what I wanted to start with today. This is what I wanted to show you. I have a lot more to tell you about this, uh, but since we're already nine minutes past the hour, or rather I overshot the correct time by only nine minutes, I would like to stop now and ask for some questions. Dan, thank you very much. Um, I've got I've got quite a few questions here. Um, Let's hear them. Yeah, let me um, let me go for the one that's most closely related to the derivation itself mm -hmm. um, by a Joel Shaw. So this says in this derivation. You're assuming, so this was posted right at the start of the derivation. In this derivation, you're assuming small perturbations, which make sense for anywhere far from the source. But what about very close to the source? For example, near the merger of the two black holes. Near the merger of the two black holes, this approximation no longer works. And that's a very valid and interesting question that you're bringing up. It means, in practice that the Einstein equation, which we just solved 
or rather wrote down in a form that can be solved analytically by a Green's function, cannot be solved analytically anymore. And what happens in those cases is that the equation is not solved analytically. We cannot write down a solution in terms of any known functions. It has to be solved numerically. And a large part of the work, the modern work in general relativity involves exactly solving the Einstein equation numerically, writing code software, which allows us to solve the Einstein equation for a given right-hand side. So we have some distribution of energy and matter in the energy momentum tensor T mu nu. And we have the motion of the binary of the two black holes on the left-hand side encoded in the Einstein tensor G mu nu. And this equation is then solved numerically with computers. What I'm showing you now is how to solve the equation far away from the source of the gravitational waves analytically. But a very good question. Thank you, Robert. Um, here's a short one mm -hmm. from Atlee Anderson. Um, what kind of books for gravitational waves and such should I buy to learn? What kind of books? Yeah, what kind of books? Very, very interesting question. Uh, thankfully, since uh, gravitational waves is a very hot topic uh, nowadays, uh, there are a lot of courses online uh, that one can use uh, in order to learn this theory. Um, I can offer you and recommend to you uh, the lecture notes from the University of Cambridge for the part three uh, program in applied mathematics, which I took some years ago now, uh, since I, it is the one that I learned from, and it is the one that I use as an inspiration uh, for these lectures at the moment. Uh, I can also recommend the lecture notes uh, by famed uh, science speaker, Shankar Rao uh, from the USA. Sorry, how do you, uh, how do you spell that? Uh, Sean Carroll uh, is with oh, a oh. double L in the end. Uh, if you have covered these and they're not enough, uh, I can definitely recommend uh, a very big book uh, called Gravitation. Uh, it's very distinct. It has an apple on its cover uh, and it's a uh, certainly more than a thousand pages long uh, by three people, uh, Misner, Wheeler, and Kip Thorne, who is one of the recipients of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for his participation in the establishing of LIGO uh, and thus in detecting gravitational waves for the first time. Uh, it's a book, not just on gravitational waves, but also on general relativity. But in it, you can definitely find uh, a long treatise on a linearized theory of gravity and how to derive all sorts of relationships and uh, formulae that I'm going to mention in, in these lectures. Um... Great, thank you. I have just typed up that, that reading list for uh, Atlee Anderson. All right, let's go for another one. Um, is uh, Actually, I'll fill that one up later. Someone's asking for a link for this uh, applied maths course. Um, I, will, I will contact Dr. Dan and I will try and get a link if it is publicly available for you, Mark. Um, let's go for another one, a bit more science-y. Um, so this one's quite interesting. Um, so what would one experience with regards to, uh, to the gravitational forces near the, the source of the colliding black holes? So is it, is it possible that the, generate, uh, the waves generate a repulsion at times? So I'm thinking maybe something analogous to, uh, to the way that you can, you can trap something with stationary waves or something like that. Are there some interesting wave phenomena um, that are maybe counterintuitive or don't 
work in the way that we expect gravity to work? Well, um, this is this is interesting because uh, gravitational waves are, you know, in themselves stretching and uh, pulling and pushing space time, and with it, everything that's in space time. So all planets, uh, stars, other black holes, and us people as well. Uh, so if we found if we find ourselves very close to a source of gravitational waves we can actually experience gravitational waves that are so strong that some of our limbs are pulled apart from our body. Uh, now, I don't recommend this. Uh, if, if you are invited to stand very close to uh, a merger of two black holes, uh, please don't accept because uh, you might suffer a very violent uh, death. Uh, Furthermore, even if you're spared by these strong gravitational waves, which again cannot be represented by this uh, small field approximation very close to the source of gravitational waves, you will still be very close, dangerously close to a black hole. Uh, and this can have uh, its own fatal consequences through a process called spaghettification, which involves you being uh, attracted and pulled into the black hole without any option of leaving and escaping. Right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure it's great, but yes, it's what happens. <laughs> Sorry, I was referring to your to your 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 answer, not the not the phenomenon, uh, which although brutal would hopefully be quite brief. Um, I'm going to be very selfish, and I'm going to inject one of my own questions. Please go ahead. Um, into this so uh you said that the two main sources that were um that were searched for with these gravitational waves are the neutron stars colliding or black holes coalescing um now from from the theory that you've explained of course gravitational waves are produced by any asymmetric um, accelerating system um, yes. however we can only detect it in very very high mass or high speed um, or high acceleration cases. But one of the things I want to know is um, why, why are neutron stars colliding um, and why are black holes colliding? Is it, is it that common that two get very close to each other? Well, it, it uh, happens all the time that uh, neutron stars and black holes that are found somewhere in space fly closer to each other. And in this process of you know, flying closer to each other, they do something called a capture process where they, they are whirled around uh, by their own attraction and they, then they stay gravitationally bound. This is definitely one of the processes through which we believe that these binaries are formed. Um, now, there is a separate uh, process uh, which is actually more common and uh, is happens in uh, so-called uh, stellar clusters. So these are play these are places in the universe in galaxies where, in a very small volume, a large number of uh, neutron stars and black holes can be found. So it's very common for them to orbit each other and merge, thus emitting gravitational waves. And the result, the resulting black holes then, or neutron stars then merge with other objects and so on. So there is, uh, it's not, it's not just a one-off process. It's something that can happen for uh, many generations of black holes and neutron stars. Mm. But yes, you are right. Any any uh, axisymmetric uh, process in the universe, any any axisymmetric motion of bodies would emit gravitational waves. Uh, even uh, a planet, which is not perfectly symmetric, but has a large bump somewhere on it, would still emit gravitational waves. Uh, it is just that at the moment, the only gravitational waves that we can reliably detect and analyze are coming from very massive objects, namely neutron stars and, and black holes. Great. Um and I've got two other questions that really nicely uh, follow on from, from this point, if I can just jump in here. 
Um, yes. so they're from Courtney McIntosh and Togaro Brandor. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just read them both out. So they're, they're very, very similar. So what characteristics of gravitational waves allow you to identify the types of objects that emit them? That's the first question. And the second question um, is, would there be any classification for different waves as if a very big object implodes or some other disturbance that aren't massive objects orbiting alike to what we do for weather phenomena like storms? Uh, so to, to answer the first question, um, it's it's a very valid research question. How do we how do we know whether it's black holes or neutron stars merging? Uh, well, there are several ways to know. First of all, uh, neutron stars tend to not be very heavy. So they are uh, at most um, on the order of one to two solar masses, uh, which means that when they uh, if if the resulting objects uh, the resulting object is between two or three solar masses, then it could either be neutron stars or black holes merging, because black holes can also be very light. Uh, however, if it's if, if the if the objects are found to be heavier, uh, so in, in you know, five or ten or twenty or hundred solar masses, then these cannot be neutron stars. Then we know that these are black holes. Uh, Furthermore, uh, black holes, true to their name, don't emit any other signal uh, apart from the gravitational waves when they merge. Neutron stars, apart from the gravitational waves, also uh, emit a light electromagnetic signal, so in the form of light, when they merge, which can be detected alongside the gravitational wave with some delay between the two. Uh, this is this is one this is another way from which we can discern whether we're talking about uh, two neutron stars or two black holes merging, and and in in many cases there is uh, there is a big debate which of the two interpretations is correct. Mm. But do these um, do the gravitational waves themselves? Um, presumably, they vary in the polarization, their amplitude, and also in their, their wavelength. Is this true? And if this is true, true. Um, yes. what's, what's the characteristic um, amplitude profile and frequency or wavelength profile uh, and polarization for a neutron star uh, collision versus a black hole coalition? Well, these, these things are a very complicated function of the parameters of, of the uh, two objects. And very often, the gravitational waves from one and the other can look very similar. That's why the signal alone can not always tell us what the, what the objects are. We need to look for other uh, secondary characteristics, which would be able to, to tell us this. OK, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, um, okay, this one, this one is 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 very specific. Um, this is from Niranjan uh, Sridharan. Um, this one's very interesting. So, um, this is on something that I I know nothing about. So I'd be interested to 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 hear what you have to say. So, given the issues around noise during the initial LIGO detections, what measures have been put in place computationally to address these? Well, first of all, one measure that we have always known about and we have always tried to resolve is to have a very good idea of what kind of noise can be expected around the detector. So anything from storms uh, to a truck driving near one of these tunnels can produce noise in the data. Uh, but we have very good knowledge of these noise sources, so we can isolate them. For example, we for, for all possible sources of noise, uh, we know what they look like in the data from the detector, and we can now very, very reliably uh, model them and subtract them from the data. 
that's okay. that's one way in which in which we isolate noise. The other is, of course, through uh, upgrading the hardware that goes into the detector, uh, which you know, allows us to better isolate the isolate the signal from the noise. Okay, thank you. Um, this one from Ian Smith. Um, is there any noteworthy news about the LISA project? Um, perhaps you could just give us a brief overview of what the LISA project is and if there is any noteworthy news about it. Well, uh, the detectors that I've been telling you about, uh, the two in the US, the one in Italy and one in Japan, uh, are all are ground-based gravitational wave observatories. And as you, Alex, pointed out, uh, their size is limited by funding and by what's feasible to construct on Earth. Our next huge objective is to build a much larger detector in space. Uh, this is the LISA project, and it involves three uh, identical or near identical satellites that fly in a constellation of an equilateral triangle with distance in each of the sites about 1 million kilometers. So these three satellites, which for now are projected to be launched in 2034, so not for another 13 years, unfortunately, it takes a lot of development uh, to build something that will reliably operate for many years in space. The idea is that the longer distance between the satellites would mean would, would equate to a longer arm. So instead of four kilometers, we have one million kilometers. And that would allow us uh, to detect gravitational waves in an entirely new frequency range. Right now, the gravitational waves that are detected by LIGO are high frequency gravitational waves. With LISA, we'll be able to detect low frequency gravitational waves, which are produced by different sources than the ones that we can detect now, and will tell us a lot more that we don't know about at the moment. Uh, at the moment, there is nothing uh, newsworthy to the public. Uh, there is a lot of progress being done in the collaboration, in the LISA collaboration. Uh, in completing all the tasks uh, before the satellites are launched. Uh, all the hardware needs to be first designed and then built and tested. On top of that, all the software that will be used for analyzing the data that comes from the satellite needs to also be developed and tested. So naturally this will take many years. So between now and 2034, when this is scheduled to fly, uh, there is a lot to be done on this project. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to wrap up with our last question now, because we're, we're running sure. out of the, the, the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to abuse my privilege, and I'm going to ask one more of my own questions, but I'm going to wrap it up into, into uh, another question asked by by uh, Rocco Waz. Um, so Rocco's question is, when considering electromagnetic waves, which we, we kind of think of as analogous in some way to gravitational waves, um, we speak of oscillating fields. Um, so Rocco's question is, what is it that oscillates in a gravitational wave? Um, and I think the, the, the answer in some ways is space-time itself is, is oscillating in the material within it. And my question to, to elaborate upon that is um, if we have some sort of system and it's radiating gravitational waves yeah. um, and the gravitational waves themselves carry away energy but they are themselves um, oscillations in the space in in space time um, if they in, if they are in some way energy themselves as well as being oscillations in space time do they not as energy also warp the space-time themselves? Have I, have I got this completely messed up in my head? 
Um, how can something that is both a distortion in space-time carry the energy, which then furthermore distorts space-time? Um, does that make sense? Well, it, it is true that gravitational waves do themselves distort space-time. So if they, you know, there are gravitational waves passing through the Earth right now, and they have the effect of, of stretching and squishing space-time in various directions all the time. It's just that these gravitational waves are so unbelievably weak that we, that we have no way of feeling them. But it, it, since they carry energy, this energy is manifested in the form of, of warping or as I prefer calling it, pulling and squishing space time as they pass through it. I see. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's our, that's our last uh, question that I'm going to pose to you. That is, alas, not, uh, not the last question that we've, uh, we've got. We've still got one, two, three, four, five, five questions that are left unanswered. So perhaps we could do some sort of follow up as we've done with, uh, with your lecture with our students before, um, and we can post this online. We can either do that as a video um, or as a, um, as, a, as, as a piece of text. Um, so I'd just like to, to wrap up and thank you again uh, for giving us your, your, your time and your expertise and uh, your, your energy today. Um, and I really look forward to continuing, uh, continuing these, uh, these conversations and this collaboration between Phoenix Space and academics. And I'd also like to thank all our attendees um, and especially those of you who have asked some fantastic questions. Um, I really hope that I've, I've done the best to, uh, to illuminate, uh, illuminate these with, um, with Dan. And for those of you that have not had your questions answered, I do apologize. I will do my best uh, to get those um, to get those answered in one form or another. So just before be, before you all, you all go, um, I'd just like to to reiterate the um, how helpful it would be for all of you to answer the survey and to give us as much information as to your um, to your interest and any other topics you'd like us to address in uh, in future lectures. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much to, to Dr. Dan. And um, yeah, good night, everybody. Till next time. Thank you very much, Alex. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.